Hey, family. Excuse me while I put my cup down. Right. There's something I want you to do for me today. What I want you to do is that I want you to imagine that this set is the Harper, um, the Harper Lounge Room. Now work with me on this one. If I have to stare into this little camera lens, this is about this big and all of you are into that little space, then I think you can help me out on this one. So here we go. To my left, you can have the imaginary Harper Lounge Suite with the imaginary Harper family on there. We've got one, two, three, and Russell's missing. Oh well, on with the show, never mind. Also at my feet, I've got the imaginary um, Rhodesian Ridgeback snoring loudly. And at the door, we have the imaginary ragdoll cat meowing to go in and out and in and out. But on with the show. This is important. Here I have my communion. And this is what we are needing to get today for um, the communion service. It's Easter Friday where we celebrate communion. So if you don't have your bread and your wine ready to go, how about you pop out to the kitchen now and make sure it's ready before church starts. That would be fabulous. And I've just got a few little things to check off before we start. Communion is prepared, check. Number two, to take the hot cross buns out of the freezer for the Zoom room chat after church, check. My device is on, ready for live stream. Now, this really amuses me, you know, because for years when my kids were little, they'd be sitting next to me in church and I'm going, shh, quiet, don't want to hear a word, stop talking. But now it's chat online as much as you like. But there we go, how times have changed. And fourthly, my cup of tea. Here we go, ready to go, church is on. Oh, that's right. I'm up first. Welcome, Centrepoint family. It's time to take your seats. Centrepoint at home is about to start. Thanks for joining us today to remember a significant day in history, Easter Friday. And I know that today looks different. It feels different than how we normally have Easter together but we can still remember and give weight to this significant day, Easter Friday. Now we know this current world situation will change us, but today we focus on that Friday, all those years ago, when the destiny of humanity was changed forever. On this great and terrible day, we see that the sky blackened, the earth shook, and the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. Today we remember the sacrifice, the cost, the painful death, the willingness to pay the price for others and the humiliation, the mocking and the crown of thorns. We remember the selflessness, the innocent one dying, the agape love and painful sorrow of the Father, the unfathomable obedience of the Son. Today we remember the cross. Thanks worship team. There exists a love far greater than we will ever understand. A love prophesied for ages. Send to disrupt the rain of darkness. Challenge the skeptics. A love that quenches our thirst. Seeks after the sick. And mends the broken. A love that came to our rescue. Despite our betrayal and our denial, we bore the weight of our sin. Facing death by being nailed to a cross.
and while darkness appeared victorious. This love emerged from the grave.
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Come on, sing it out. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. Come on, do you believe it, church? There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Lift your voice, there's no shadow. No shadow you won't. Well, welcome Centrepoint Church. Um, thanks for joining us on our Centrepoint at Home service and particularly for our Good Friday service. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, yep, I'm back on my feet and uh, it's great to be with you today. And look, from my heart to yours, wish I could see you face to face. You can see mine, but I can't see yours. But I uh, just want you to know that I'm so glad to be able to talk to you in this way today. So it's Good Friday. And uh, we're going to have a Good Friday message. And I want to go straight to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. And it says this, and this is, this is uh, Joseph. And Joseph, of course, was engaged to Mary, to marry Mary. And Mary was pregnant and had nothing to do with Joseph. And, of course, Joseph is wondering what to do. And then God sends a messenger to him in a dream. And here's what the messenger said to Joseph. said this, Talking about Mary, says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Here's the important bit. Because he will save his people from their sins. Because he will save his people from their sins. Now, right now, there's a lot of fear, uh, and rightly so, around the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, it's not unreasonable that people are feeling... Um, varying degrees of fear. And, you know, it's it's not something that you choose. It's something that you um, accidentally catch from someone else. Uh, it can make you sick. And certainly for some people, they're, they're very vulnerable to that, to that sickness. And uh, we've seen right around the world that it's taken many lives. Um, there's not a vaccine for it. And uh, and it's, it's not just the virus itself, but the consequences that are surrounding the virus, um, i.e. financial hardship, um, isolation and separation. 
And so it's not unreasonable that we have a fear or a certain degree of fear for the coronavirus pandemic. However, as bad as that is, there's something else that we should fear far more, something that is far more fearful. In fact, Luke chapter 12, verse 4 says this. It says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that do no more. In other words, it's saying this, the greatest fear that we should have is not for things that can only hurt us in this life. Um, And it goes on, it says, the things that we should really fear are not just things that can hurt us in this life, in the things that are just temporary or in our body, but things that can harm your soul, things that can harm you eternally. And the reality of it is this, that corona, the corona pandemic is actually something that can only harm your body, a temporary thing. But the virus talked about in this verse, which we've just read, can not only harm our body, but it can harm our soul, which is eternal. It's that part of you that lives forever. So what is this virus that the Bible is talking about? Well, it's what the Bible calls sin. And uh, this verse tells us what the virus is, but it also tells us how we can be vaccinated from it. Uh, The verse says, as we've already quoted, it says, he shall save his people from their sins. Um, We could actually um, reinterpret it, if you like, as this. We could put it this way. He shall vaccinate his people from their virus. And uh, so let's talk about this virus called sin for a moment. Firstly, uh, it's it's something that we catch from someone else. Um, we're, in fact, we caught it from our parents. We're born with it. We're born, the Bible tells us, with a sinful nature. Let me put it this way. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Let me say it one more time. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. You see, when Adam sinned, um, he acted as the fountainhead, as the federal head of all mankind. And we could put it this way. He polluted the gene pool from there, from, from henceforth on. Um, we're all born with a sin nature. And the best illustration I can think of is this. Um, growing up, I grew up on a farm and we were near a beautiful river called the Kiwa River. And uh, every now and again, our, uh, we would have a situation where our next door neighbour, uh, Mr. Garoni, hi Mr. Garoni, uh, one of his cows would get into the river and would get stuck and it would die in the river. And so the cow was dead in the water and as a result, eventually over time, the cow would pollute the whole river, it would pollute downstream. So if one of us went down and had a drink of water from the river, well, we would get sick because why? The stream was polluted upstream. So the picture here is this, that the human, uh, the human race, if you like, the, the human stream was polluted by Adam's actions. And as a result, we have a natural inclination towards sin. Um, this is highlighted in a, uh, a book called um, The Confessions of Augustine. Now, for those of you who might know, Augustine was one of the original or one of the early, I should say, church fathers And he wrote a book called The Confessions, His Confessions. And it was basically where he confessed all of his sins. And uh, he, he, in this book, uh, he describes the worst sin that he ever committed. And wait for it, the worst sin that Augustine said he ever committed was that he stole his neighbor's pears. He was hanging out with some of his friends and their neighbor had a beautiful pear tree in their backyard and they climbed over the fence and they stole pears from the neighbor's tree. And uh, one of the critics reading this book goes, what is this guy's problem? I mean, has he got an overactive conscience? Is he obsessed with this whole idea of sin? I mean, we've got people committing murder and acts of violence and and stealing. Um, And yet here he is worried about stealing pears. Well, Augustine goes on to explain and he basically says this. He said, I can understand why people commit certain sins. I can see why people commit sins of passion. I can understand why a hungry man would steal. I can understand why certain sins would take place. But he said, stealing pears was my worst sin because he said, I stole pears even though I hate pears. I don't even like pears. But I stole the pears for the sheer thrill of stealing the pears. And as a result, he realised that there was something in him that was driving him to... um, to 
enjoy just the mere fact of sinning. And we see that around the world where, um, you know, where, where accountability is taken away or um, restraints are taken off people and suddenly people will do things simply because they can. And uh, the, so the result is this, that we are born, and just like Augustine um, highlights in his book, we are born with, um, with this propensity towards sinning. We're born with, uh, with where, where our will, or should I call it our won't, uh, we just want our own way. If, you, if you're not convinced of that, um, if you've had kids, just, just think back for a little bit um, about your kids. What's one of the first words that your kids ever learn? Is it mum? No. No, and it's not dad. One of the first words that kids ever learn is no. And uh, you tell a kid to do this and they will do that instead. And uh, so I want you to know today that firstly, this, this virus called sin, it, it's viral. It's something that we've all got. We've all caught it and we've all caught it from Adam. And the consequences of it are, are quite obvious. The consequences are actually quite dire. Firstly, uh, sin messes up our lives. And, you know, we see where uh, how pride messes up so many people's lives and selfishness and, and greed and anger and abuse and all these things. We see the results of, of sin. And, uh, you know, the very thing that we think at times is going to give us life or is actually going to be something that we'll enjoy actually brings us a lot of pain and hurt and actually ultimately takes life from us. See, sin is actually by its nature very destructive. Um, you know, out of little things, big things grow. We've all heard the ad on TV, but when it comes to sin, that's the truth. Um, Cain, the Bible records the first murder where Cain kills his brother Abel because Cain was jealous of his brother Abel. And we see Cain is just jealous of his brother and God speaks to Cain and he says, Cain, be careful. He says, sin is crouching at your door and it wants to have you. And, uh, you know, those, that whole idea of sin crouching, it's kind of like it makes itself small and insignificant and it just seemed like he was just jealous of his brother. I mean, everybody, that's just natural, that's just normal. But Cain didn't realise that in that jealousy was crouching murder. And when he, he gave into that sin of jealousy as it was, actually it's something that turned into murder. And so we see the consequences of sin all around us and how sin messes up our lives. But there's something far worse. The biggest consequence of sin is this, and that is that it separates us from God. Right now, many of us are experiencing temporary separation. Let me say that again. We're experiencing temporary separation. Maybe uh, because of um, physical distancing, we're being separated from our families. Um, maybe we've been separated from our friends. Um, I know some people are separated from their kids. Uh, right now we're separated from each other. We can't meet together as a church. So there's a temporal, um, a, a temporal isolation, a temporal separation that's taking place. And, and uh, maybe even outside of this, you know, outside of the whole uh, situation we're in now, there's some of you that have experienced separation on a greater level. You, many of you are immigrants. You've come to this nation and you've experienced separation from family and maybe some of you even experienced the separation of a loved one when, when a loved one has died or passed on. And uh, so we, we understand what separation feels like and it makes us feel helpless. It's, it's not the way we want it. Um, we can feel powerless to change it, so we just wait it out. Well, that's bad enough, being separated temporarily, but sin is far worse because sin separates us from God. Um, Sin separates us from God, and if we don't deal with it, actually sin separates us from God eternally and forever. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says this, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, we've all, we're all separated from God, and it's sin that separates us and keeps us distant from God. Um, Luke 16 talks about sin being a chasm, but, uh, sorry, the separation between us and God is, is like a huge chasm that's set between us. And so I just want you to imagine for a moment, if I may, that um, let's, I don't know if you can see this mat, but let's just say from this side of the mat to the other side of the mat, let's just um, pick a number. Pick a number, anybody? Pick a number. Um, five, ten, ten, I heard ten. Let's call it ten kilometres, right? It's ten kilometres from this side of the mat to the other side of the mat. Can you picture that? All right. Now, I want you to imagine there's three people here standing on this side 
And they all have different ideas of how they can make it to the other side, how they can, and in between this side and the other side, there's this huge chasm, like it's, it's a deep, deep chasm and, to, and not to make it to the other side is certain death. And so here we have the first guy and the first guy, let's just say he was a long jump record holder um, at Ipswich High. Uh, he, he thinks he could. He thinks he's good enough to jump it. So he uh, puts on his his Nikes and his 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 uh, lycra singlet or whatever it is, and uh, he sets himself up and off he goes, heads off towards the edge. He chariots a fire plane in the background and he hits the edge of the of the of the of the chasm and he leaps out and he gets about this far and down he goes like a stone. And there's two more standing on this side and the other guy, one of the other guys goes, loser. Oh, hang on, on the camera, is that loser or loser? Which one's right? That one's right, loser. <laughs> he says, uh, I, I reckon in my car I could jump that chasm. I reckon I could make it. And he said, I've got a, I've got a Holden Commodore sitting at home. And Holden Commodore, anyone remember Holden's? Holden, what's a Holden? Does anyone remember what a Holden is? Sure you do. So he says, I reckon if I set up a ramp, I can jump that distance. So he goes and he hops in his... Commodore and he puts the key in and he starts it up. It's a hold, all right? If it was a Ford, it would start. Anyway, finally it, it, it roars into life and he heads off down the road in his Commodore, fast as it'd go. He hits the jump and off he goes into the air and he's looking good till he gets to about here and down he goes like a stone. The last guy goes, No way. He says, Fancy thinking they could jump it on foot or in a car. But he says, I've got a motorbike in my shed. I've got a BMW GS1200. I reckon if I set up a bigger ramp, I can make it. So he hops in his motorbike and he starts it up and he heads off down the road and well in the 200 kilometers an hour, as fast as he could go, his legs flapping in the breeze. He hits the jump, flies into the air and he's looking good to about here and well short, down he goes. None of them made it. You see, the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, What's the standard of God? The standard of God is absolute perfection. That's the, that's, that's the standard, perfection. Only perfect people can be in heaven or dwell with God. And so let's just say this person here was the worst living person and this person's the best living. doesn't matter. At the end of the day, all have sinned and fall short of the standard or the glory of God. You see, that's the results of the virus of sin, we are separated. Our sin separates us from God. And despite of our best efforts, see, we've all got different ideas of what our vaccine should be. You know, for some people, their vaccine is if I can just be good enough, I can make the distance. Um, some people, it's kind of like, well, I'm just going to hope for the best. For others, it's like I'm going to balance the scales if my good works outweigh my bad works, I can make the distance. For others, it's kind of like the comparison vaccine. You know, if, if my life's not as bad as others, well, surely being rated on a curve, I can make that distance. Well, what is the answer? What's the vaccine? Well, that's what Good Friday is all about. That's what Easter is all about. That's what the gospel, the good news is all about. Jesus becomes our vaccine. Jesus said this. He, he, Jesus becomes our bridge. And he says this in John 14 and verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's kind of like when Jesus died on the cross, and many of us would have seen the picture, but it's kind of, it's like he's bridging the gap between man and God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but by me. You see, in the Old Testament, they used to, sacrifice a lamb for the sins of the people because they knew that without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sin. The Bible told us quite clearly that the wages of sin is death and the only way that sin could be atoned for or paid for was the death of and blood, and blood being shed. And so they used to take a lamb and they used to um, sacrifice a lamb for the sins of the people and they couldn't just take any old lamb. It had to be a perfect, had to be the best lamb that they had in their flock it couldn't be a, um, you know, they couldn't get some fly-blowing old thing that was going to die anyway. No, it had to be a genuine sacrifice. It had to be the very, it had to cost them dearly. And they would sacrifice the lamb and the blood of the lamb was shed, if you like, and the life of the lamb was given as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the people. 
that actually really tied into something that was very important to those people. You see, because many years before, they'd been captives under the, in the land of Egypt, under the Egyptians. And uh, many of you would have seen the movie, Charlton Heston as Moses. And, uh, you know, it's called The Exodus. And we, the, the, and, and we read about how, um, you know, Moses comes before Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And, and so Moses said God's going to send plagues. And there was the plague of the frogs and plague of blood and the plague of darkness, etc. And finally it come to the last plague, which was going to be the, the death of the firstborn. And so God said to the children of Israel, they said, hey, um, tonight the angel of death is going to go through the land of Egypt and, and it's going to take the life of every firstborn. But if you kill a lamb, a, a perfect lamb, it, it, once again, it had to be the best lamb you had. And if you take its blood, sounds gory, doesn't it? But listen to this. If you take its blood and you put it over the lintel, over the door of your house, when the, when the angel of death goes through Egypt that night, if it comes to the house and the blood of the lamb is on the house, you're going to live. And, uh, you know, think about that for a minute. There was all kinds of people in that, that, that place. And that night there was, you know, let's just say in the homes of those people, let, let's just pretend for a minute, let's modernise a little bit, but there was doctors and there was lawyers and there was teachers and there was postmen and there was plumbers and there was unemployed people. And, uh, you know, there was alcoholics and there was prostitutes and there was adulterers and murderers and liars and, well, let's really bring it close. There was Catholics and there was Baptists and there was Presbyterians and there was even people from the ACC. Um, let's bring it even closer to home. There was, there was ushers and elders and pastors and worship leaders. But you know what? It didn't matter what their station in life was. The only thing that mattered was that the blood of that lamb was put on the doorpost and they didn't fully understand it. But for those that believed it, it worked and they lived. And so... That was fresh. That was very much in the minds of those children of Israel when they would sacrifice a lamb uh, for the sins of the people. Now let's go through to the New Testament. When Jesus approached John the Baptist in the crowd, John the Baptist was doing his thing and Jesus approaches John the Baptist. John the Baptist saw him and he said these famous words. He says, behold, look, here comes the lamb of God. This is the lamb of God that takes away. Let me finish it. This is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that's who Jesus was. He became the Lamb of God. Just like in the Old Testament, they had the perfect Lamb. Just like in leaving Israel, sorry, in leaving Egypt, where they had to sacrifice a perfect Lamb. Jesus became the New Testament Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes, he's the vaccine that takes away the virus, if you like. Um, and so firstly, I want you to notice that the lamb had to be perfect. Jesus was perfect. Before he died for us, he lived for us. He lives a completely sinless life. He lives for us and then he dies for us. And in doing so, he became our sacrifice. He, he pays the price for us. He pays my penalty and your penalty for our sin. Um, he pays for the consequences of our sin. And on the cross, he, he utters those famous words. He says, it is finished. Not I am finished, but it is finished. In other words, it has been paid in full. Remember what the messenger of God told Joseph. He says, you will call him Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. And right at that moment on the cross, that was fulfilled. It is finished. Jesus become the vaccine. And it's not something that we take every year, but it was something that we just have to believe in and trust him. And in a moment, we're going to take communion. We're going to remember the death of Jesus on the cross. And when we take communion, we, in fact, I'll get it and bring it up. When we take communion, we have the bread, which represents the broken body of Jesus and we have the juice which represents the shed blood of Jesus and this represents a relationship now with God this is what it represents we're no longer separated remember that we've all got this virus called sin sin messes our lives up but it separates us from God and Jesus then bridges the gap between man and God and so when we have communion it represents 
a relationship with God again, a restored relationship. And when we believe in Jesus, we're no longer separated from God. No longer do we have to live our life feeling ashamed or or living with a load of guilt or condemnation or do we have to hide from God? Instead, we receive what is called grace. What is grace? It means this. It simply is, uh, it's a word that means unmerited favour. In other words, we don't get a relationship with God on our own merits. It's not by what I've done or it's not by my good works, but it's on Jesus' merits. So it's unmerited favour. So here's the thing. Jesus becomes our vaccine for eternal life. The the virus of sin is dealt with when we believe in Jesus. There's just just one condition, one condition. You've got to believe. You've got to believe in Jesus. You've got to put your trust in Jesus. You see, you're not included in this. I'm not included in this. You're not included in this if you don't believe. Probably the best known verse in the Bible. Yeah, you guessed it. John 3.16 says this, says, For God so loved. That's the greatest love ever. For God so loved. If You need to know today, what does God think of you? He loves you. He's not angry with you. He's not mad at you. He loves you. For God so loved. That's the greatest love. He so loved the world. If you're in the world, you're included. God so loved the world that He gave His Son. That's the greatest gift, the greatest gift that we've ever received. You know, if you ever wondered if you're valuable, you know the value of something by what was paid for it. Well, Jesus gave his son. He he paid an incredibly high price, the highest gift. He gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. That whosoever believes, that's the greatest invitation. It's the greatest love. It's the greatest gift and it's the greatest invitation you'll ever receive. It says, whosoever, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, won't fall into this, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes in him. What does it mean to believe? It means, it just doesn't mean that you have a a mental assent to it or you're kind of like, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. It literally means to put your weight on, to, to place your faith, to 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 bank your life on it, to build your life on it. I I believe in you, Jesus. I trust in you. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You've just got to believe in him. I trust you have today. What does it mean to believe? What does it take to believe? It simply means you have to humble yourself and say, Jesus, I don't believe in me. You know, some of us, we think we're okay with God because we believe in us. Or we believe in mankind. But ultimately, we have to believe in Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe in you and I receive your grace, your unmerited favour. And, you know, maybe you've never done that. Maybe you're watching this and I I don't know everybody who's watching me, but maybe you've never done that before. and You've never said, Jesus, I believe in you. And that's what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean you suddenly follow a whole heap of rules and regulations. And No, no, no. It's about a relationship. And you can simply have that relationship by saying, Jesus, I believe in you. Simply just, just for a moment, just, just pray this prayer. Just if you, if you want Jesus to come into your life, if, if you want to believe in him to have a relationship with God, simply just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. I know you love the whole world, but also I'm included in that. You died on the cross for my sin. And I want to put my trust in you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life. And I ask you to give me eternal life. I want to be one of the whosoever that believes in you. Thank you, Jesus, that you're my Savior and you're my Lord. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to contact us and just let us know somehow. Uh, I think there's a button there you can press or there's a response in some way you can do that and maybe we can explain that a little bit later but we'd love to hear from you in some way because we'd love to help you um, take the next step or help you understand that more. And so what about the rest of us here? What, what, What do we do with this wonderful gift that Jesus gave us that has joined us to God in relationship? Well, we're thankful. We live a life of thankfulness. And, uh, you know, Jesus, it said Jesus took the bread and he broke it. 
and he gave thanks. He gave thanks. You know, think about that. Jesus was about to face his most difficult moment in life. He was about to go to the cross. He was about to suffer the, the, the horrendous work of the cross that the Romans knew how to do so well. And yet in doing so, he gave thanks. And I think the lesson for you and I is this, that even in our hardest moment, we can give thanks. Even in our present circumstances, I know some of you are going through a real hard time with this. Even in our present circumstance, we can give thanks. Why? Because Jesus was able to give thanks because he saw the other side. He saw what it would accomplish. And we can give thanks when we take communion because we can see the other side. We can see that our sin is forgiven. We can see that um, we have a friend in Jesus and we can see that eternity is ours. So why don't we take communion together in your homes? I trust you've got some communion with you, whether it's a simple bit of bread or juice, however it is. But let's just take a moment on this Good Friday and just eat and drink together. And uh, Jesus took the bread and he broke and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He says, eat all of it in remembrance of me. So come on, let's just eat the bread together in thankfulness. Just where you are, just thank him that he allowed himself that, that he gave himself. Then we take the cup, which represents his shed blood, represents the forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. And uh, I'm glad he shed his blood so that I wouldn't have to. And today we have a relationship with God because of the blood of Jesus. So come on, let's... Let's drink together. Come on, let's just give thanks for a moment. Father, we thank you that you gave us Jesus who has become our vaccine from sin. Thank you, Father, that you've given us life. You've not just given us life in this life, but you've given us eternal life. And Father, I pray today that you would cause us to give thanks today because our sin is forgiven. We have a friend in Jesus and eternity is ours. Father, I pray today that through this dark time, through this difficult time for some, that you would help us to see the other side today. And Father, I thank you today for Good Friday, all it represents to us. And today we just rejoice in the cross, in all of its pain and all of its shame. How can we call it Good Friday? Well, it was good for us. And we thank you for that today. We say we believe in you, our trust is in you, and we rejoice together. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for dying on the cross for our sin, that we might have a relationship with God in heaven. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Why not stay online, chat with each other, or you could open a Zoom room or phone a friend and warm up those hot cross buns. We'll see you again on Easter Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 5 p.m. when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ and all that this means for us. See you Sunday.